in both Joe Rogan's recent podcast with Andrew Huberman and his previous podcast with Ben Patrick, the concept of hormesis of plant foods, specifically broccoli, sulforaphane containing broccoli as a possible benefit of vegetables has come up multiple times. Joe and I talked about this in the first podcast we did, but I wanted to do a little bit more in depth, but still kind of short video on my views on this vegetables as hormetic agents issue to clarify it for Joe and everyone. So in these clips, which I will show here from Ben Patrick's episode and from Andrew Huberman's recent episode just earlier this week, Joe is comparing vegetables to sauna. Paul Saladino always wants to talk about is plant defense chemicals and about eating plants that plants don't want you to eat them. And so when you eat them, they're excreting these plant defense chemicals. Now, my thing on that is, and this is uh, one of the things that Rhonda Patrick likes to talk about, is that that may have a hormetic effect. So there might be benefit to that, just like there's benefit to cold therapy and hot therapy, and that there's some foods that eating them, even though they do have these defense chemicals, those defense chemicals, at least in certain doses, might have a beneficial effect on your body. But he had this whole thing about them, about the chemicals, the oxalates in different forms of vegetables like kale and, and other, other vegetables that we think of being healthy that might not be good for you. However, there's other doctors that look at these chemicals and look at these things and say, no, these, when you eat them in the proper quantities, are good for you because they have a hermetic effect. They have an effect similar to the effect that you get from being in a sauna. Like if you're in 185 degrees for the rest of your life, you're dead, mm. right? But if you're in 185 degrees for 20 minutes, it's actually very good for you because your body produces these heat shock proteins in response to that heat. So this, this is where the debate sets in, and this is where I'm not sure who's correct. But what I do know is when I eat nothing but meat and fruit, I feel fucking great. My impression of the comparison there is that as we know that sauna, increasing the heat in your environment can be a hormetic. This is a word that means a little bit of a poison may be good for you. And indeed there is a good amount of evidence that doing sauna can increase heat shock proteins, but sauna is stressful. So it creates a stress and your body responds to that stress. Joe is comparing this stress from sauna to broccoli or vegetables in general. Now, in my book, The Carnivore Code, I drew a distinction between these, and I want to clarify that distinction. This is molecular hormesis in the case of broccoli, or sometimes called xenohormesis. These are just hypothetical terms that are essentially made up by the scientific community. Nobody really knows if this happens, versus environmental hormesis, which I think is something that is well-established and happens every day to us if we are living our lives outside in the natural world. Environmental hormesis being things like sauna, cold plunge, maybe you're swimming in a cold river. Sometimes when I'm out surfing in the morning, even in Costa Rica, I get a little cold because the water is cold and I'm not wearing any wetsuit or the water is relatively cold. Uh, but exercise also does this. Fasting does this. It appears that sun exposure might even do this. So there are clearly things that we experience in our environment, heat, cold, exercise, and fasting being the main environmental stressors that appear to be uh, activators of a molecular system called the NRF2 system, which I'll show in a moment. Now, similarly, plant compounds can activate this system. But the difference is that plant compounds are like any pharmaceutical drug you take in that they are going to have many side effects in the human body, some of which are cataloged, some of which are not. When you go to a doctor and get a medication, many of you may not get medications from a doctor, but believe me, when a patient goes to a doctor and gets medication, the doctor must give the patient some sort of an education regarding the side effects of that medication. These side effects come in a package insert in these medications when the patient receives the medication from a pharmacist. But these side effects of plant molecules have widely been ignored. And that is what I will illustrate in this video. But the high level difference here is that when you get into a sauna, you are getting an environmental input. There is no molecule going into your body. When you are in the sun, when you are exercising, or when you go in a cold plunge, you are getting an environmental input that is changing your biochemistry, often causing a small amount of oxidative stress, which turns on the NRF2 system, which ultimately results in more glutathione, which may be a good thing, possibly for humans long-term. Now, when you do broccoli sprouts, which contain sulforaphane, I'll use that as the prototypic uh, hormetic agent or quote unquote antioxidant, which is a misnomer, as you'll see in this video you are taking in a molecule, whether you're taking in sulforaphane pills, whether you're taking in broccoli sprouts extract, whole broccoli sprouts, broccoli or cabbage or any other compound that contains isothiocyanates like sulforaphane, you are taking in molecules. Now, 
we must not ignore that those molecules can have other side effects in the human body. So yes, as Joe is comparing these, sauna is in some ways similar to broccoli. Where these differ is that the broccoli has negative side effects. And my argument regarding many plant foods that are widely touted as beneficial hormetics as humans is that the juice is not worth the squeeze. In this case, the side effects of the broccoli sprouts or the sulforaphane probably outweigh the benefits because you can get the benefits by doing many other things like sauna, like exercise, like being in the sun, like cold plunge. And there's really no good data. We really don't have good evidence that eating vegetables creates benefits above and beyond what living a quote unquote healthy life may do for humans. But we do know that these plant molecules have many side effects in humans, something that I have tried to highlight with my work, something that I think has been widely ignored in our consideration of vegetables and plant molecules historically in the nutrition sphere, these negative side effects. Let's start with some of the benefits of sulforaphane illustrated in clinical studies. I think this is what people get a little misled by. So this is not to say that sulforaphane in broccoli sprouts, which we're using as the prototypic hormetic agent, doesn't have some benefits when considered with a myopic lens, blinders, not considering side effects in humans. And I will show you a brief sampling of those benefits. So here's a paper from Molecular Neuropsychology showing that sulforaphane augments glutathione and influences brain metabolites in human subjects, a clinical pilot study. So in this study, they used large amounts of sulforaphane supplementation to get this much sulforaphane from broccoli or even more concentrated forms of sulforaphane in broccoli sprouts. You would have to eat kilogram quantities of broccoli sprouts or broccoli and something that is not possible for any human even the most pious vegan could not eat this much broccoli or broccoli sprouts. We know that sulforaphane levels peak at three milligrams per gram at around 48 hours of growing broccoli sprouts. At three milligrams per gram, you'd have to eat three and a half kilograms of broccoli sprouts to get 10 grams of sulforaphane, which is the amount of sulforaphane that has been used in some of the trials with diabetes. This is a trial looking at uh, brain and blood levels. These are psychiatric patients, but as you'll see here, when they were given sulforaphane, there was an increase in glutathione in the blood and in certain regions of the brain, okay? This is what gets people excited. And in this study, which is broccoli sprouts reduce oxidative stress and type 2 diabetes, uh, is using broccoli sprout powder. And they did show that in these patients with diabetes, giving them broccoli sprout powder, which contains sulforaphane, improved total antioxidant capacity, it improved uh, oxidative stress inducts, it improved malondialdehyde levels, and it decreased oxidized low density lipoprotein. This isn't that surprising because we know the mechanism of sulforaphane, and it's the same mechanism of exercise. It's the same mechanism of fasting. Well, one of the mechanisms of fasting, it's the same mechanism of sauna and a lot of the same mechanisms of cold plunging. It's this NRF2 transcription factor, which is associated with KEEP1. You get this electrophiles oxidative stress, which again can be things like sulforaphane, which are oxidative stressors. They are pro-oxidants, not antioxidants. And NRF2 dissociates moves across, this is the nuclear membrane into the nucleus where it binds to other molecules at the antioxidant response element on a gene uh, leading to polymerization. This is a polymerase enzyme and transcription of genes, okay? These genes include things like glutathione synthase, glutathione peroxidase, et cetera, genes involved in the overall antioxidant response in humans. So this is to say that if you eat sulforaphane, you can, it appears that humans can turn on the formation of glutathione, glutathione-related genes improve your antioxidant response, at least in the short term. This is why I believe Joe has been told by people like Rhonda Patrick that broccoli sprouts, sulforaphane are good for you because they turn on glutathione production. And indeed, there are some good clinical outcomes. There are a couple of things that are being missed here. Firstly, you can get the same benefits. You can turn on these same genes. You can turn on that NRF2 system 
by doing things that are environmental hormetics without using molecular and or xenohormesis. The second and perhaps more important piece of the equation is that I think it's better for humans to turn on those genes and get glutathione production and get this optimal antioxidant response from environmental hormetics versus molecular hormetics because of the side effects of the molecular hormetics, in this case, sulforaphane. I'll show you those in one moment. So what are the side effects? What is the package insert of sulforaphane? The main side effects of this molecule that I have concerns about involve inhibiting the absorption of iodine at the level of the thyroid, leading to problems with thyroid hormone synthesis. You can see papers like this illustrate this very clearly. Concentrations of thiocyanate and goitrin, these are isothiocyanate compounds similar to sulforaphane in human plasma, their precursor concentrations in brassica vegetables and the associated potential risk for hypothyroidism. You can see that these are part of a family of isothiocyanates, including sulforaphane and other isothiocyanates, okay? So radioiodine uptake to the thyroid is inhibited by 194 micromole of goitrin, but not 77 micromole of goitrin. Collards, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale contain sufficient goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake to the thyroid. They go on to say that turnip tops, commercial broccoli, broccoli rabe, and kale uh, don't have as much goitrin and are probably not going to be a problem. But when you're trying to get to 10 grams of sulforaphane per day, and you're eating pounds of broccoli sprouts or lots and lots of broccoli sprouts. And again, they didn't assay broccoli sprouts for amounts of goitrin or other isothiocyanates, nor have humans really fully investigated the antithyroid potential, the goitrogenic potential of many of these isothiocyanates. People are eating tons of broccoli sprouts, concentrated isothiocyanates in broccoli sprouts powder. What are we doing to our thyroids? Could we be nuking our thyroids in a negative way? And for what? And for what? Just go get in your sauna just go get in your cold plunge, just go exercise, just go get in the sun. Yet another problem I have here is with some of the estrogenic potential of this family of plants, the estrogenic effects of extracts from cabbage, fermented cabbage, and acidified Brussels sprouts. And they did it on a cell line. So this is a human breast cancer cell line, but they said that there are estrogenic effects of these compounds on a estrogen responsive cancer cell line. These effects seem to be variable depending on the dose, meaning that low doses had different effects than high doses, but clearly compounds in the brassica family, which includes broccoli, Brussels sprouts, et cetera, appear to affect us hormonally. We must remember the intention of these plants is clear. They're not our friends. They don't want you to eat their leaves. Plants don't want you to eat a kale leaf or a broccoli floret or any of these things. Are we sure this is good for us? Are we sure this is the best way to increase our glutathione? I would say no. What is the best way to increase your glutathione? I think it's by doing environmental hormetic activities, which are things like cold water swimming. Here's a really interesting article on uric acid and glutathione levels during short-term whole body cold exposure. They looked at 10 healthy subjects who swam in ice cold water. I believe it was in Germany. And they looked at their glutathione levels. What happens when you swim in cold water? Your glutathione levels go down. Oxidative stress happens, activating the NRF2 system, and then, your glutathione levels go up in the future because there is a quote unquote hormetic effect. This is what we can achieve by doing activities in life. Why do we need sulforaphane? And furthermore, it's really important to understand that there are many studies like this one, which show that increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables in your diet, presumably which contain compounds like sulforaphane, doesn't really change antioxidant markers or markers of oxidative stress after a 12 week intervention. This is just one of a few, but I'm just showing this one for the sake of uh, brevity. So this study was a 12 week randomized clinical trial, 19 men and 26 women who had low reported fruit, juice and vegetable intake, less than three portions per day. They were randomized con to consume either their usual diet or a diet supplemented with an additional 480 grams of fruit and vegetables and fruit juice for 12, for 12 weeks, that's over a pound of fruit and vegetables and 300 milliliters of fruit juice for 12 weeks. At the end of the study, they said, while increasing fruit, juice, and vegetable consumption increases circulating levels of beneficial nutrients, this being carotenoids, which are in the vegetables, a 12-week intervention was not associated with effects on the antioxidant status or lymphocyte DNA damage. Where are the benefits 
of the vegetables. Where are the benefits of plant foods? Again, it was mixed with fruit in this study, but there are many studies like this which show that increasing fruit and vegetables in the diet doesn't change markers of oxidative stress or lymphocyte DNA damage in a study that's longer than four weeks. Some of them are four, some of them are eight, some of them are 12. This is, has been my contention from the beginning. Number one, we cannot convincingly say that the benefits of things like broccoli last long-term, the body doesn't adjust. Number two, we are ignoring the side effects of these vegetables and plant compounds. And number three, we can get the same benefits without side effects by doing environmental hormetics. So as Joe is questioning, yes, vegetables are sort of like a sauna, but a sauna doesn't have the side effects. And why would you eat vegetables when you can go in the sauna and avoid the side effects? These are the questions that remain. Obviously, we don't fully understand all this, but these are my contentions. Anecdotally, there are so many people who improve by eliminating vegetables from their diet, especially things like broccoli, GI symptoms of gas and bloating improve, thyroid symptoms, mood symptoms, all kinds of autoimmune symptoms improve by cutting out brassica vegetables. We don't really fully understand the effects of this isothiocyanate compound family on humans, yet we're being told. It's being preached from the pulpits of nutritional pieism that we should eat tons of broccoli and tons of broccoli sprouts. Would our ancestors have done this? No chance. But we're not really backing it up. Nobody's really fully looking at the side effects of these. And this is where I think the difference lies. And it's why it's so important to understand that when it comes to hormesis, a sauna is not like broccoli at all.